There is a city that stops for one minute every year, and that is Warsaw. And in today's video, we're going to learn about the Warsaw Uprising, and it's the 79th anniversary today. That is just brilliant. Now, obviously, you have things like Remembrance Day uh, in November, November the 11th. And you normally at 11 o'clock, you, you know, you have a minute silence. But a lot of people don't anymore. But what's special about this is they have the siren going. So everyone knows now is the time. That was quite moving, wasn't it? That was really, really moving that the fact that everyone has just stopped, stood up, just taken the minute to think. And things like this are so important because this is how you remember. This is how you remember what happened. But also this is how you remember not to let things like this happen again. Let's find out now actually what happened at the event of the Warsaw Uprising. For five years. Execution, torture, and vicious oppression has been the fate of the Poles. But resistance, the will to fight the Nazis who occupy their homeland, has been kept alive. In the face of unspeakable brutality, the Polish Home Army, the volunteer force of resistance fighters secretly living in Poland, has continued to grow. For these fighters, discovery meant instant death. But with sabotage, indirection, and a message of hope for the people. They kept the Germans from ever feeling secure in occupied Poland. And now it was time. Russian shelling could be heard in the streets of Warsaw. Liberation was at hand. But the home army wasn't going to wait for the Russians to march into their capital and return to them whatever portion of their country they felt generous enough to give. The Warsaw Uprising was about to begin. Because, so I have already learned a little bit in the fact that the the Poles had to deal with the Nazis, the, the Germans, on the one side, and then they had the Russians that were pretending to be the saviours, and then basically, well, they were just another problem, and another, it was, which was worse, the Nazis or the Russians, and, and you Poles, I'm sure, will be able to tell me this. But let's find out how the Poles got Warsaw back. August 1st. 1944. The Allies have landed in Normandy, Rome has fallen, and the Soviets have pushed the German war machine off Russian soil. And in Warsaw, a people oppressed for five long years are about to rise up against their oppressors. But what precipitates this is the approach of the Soviet army, because the history between the Soviets and Poland is a fraught mm -hmm. one. In 1939, as allies of Hitler, Soviet forces stormed over the Polish border, taking Poland by surprise and collapsing Polish defenses. Up to that point, while not winning the war against Germany, the Polish army was taking their toll, slowing down German forces and making them pay for every inch of ground. But to do this, almost all of their forces were sent to the West, never expecting an attack from the supposedly neutral Soviet Union. When Soviet forces poured over the eastern border, it spelt the end for the Polish army. Two weeks later, Poland would surrender, and more than half would be annexed by the Soviet Union until they in turn lost it to the Nazis, double-crossing them. Can you just imagine? 
well, I think most people nowadays have to imagine, but can you imagine what the polls went through on the uh, on the West Coast? I say West Coast, not West Coast, the West side of Poland, dealing with the Nazis, doing everything they can to slow them down and make life difficult for them, or for the Soviets to come sweeping in into an empty backyard. That, that's basically what it was, right? You know, all the forces were, uh, were dealing with the Nazis and the Soviets literally walked in. That, that's what happened, right? They walked in and no one was there to stop them because the poor Poles were dealing with the Nazis. That just is so difficult to imagine. That's the issue that I think the generation of today have because most of us, and I say most of us, don't have any real reality of this. And while not as systematically brutal as Nazi occupation, the Soviet domination of Poland was still horrific. They rounded up and shot 22,000 Poles in the Katyn forest. And even when they joined the Allies, they refused to acknowledge the legitimacy of the Polish government in exile. All of which means that many in the Polish resistance believed that the only way they'd have a seat at the table after the war is if they liberated their own country. Which leads us back to the 1st of August. The Russians are a few dozen kilometers away. As their advance continues, the Germans are guaranteed to fall. It's now or never. It's time to rise up. The previous night, a tense meeting had occurred, and W hour, the start of the Polish uprising, was declared. The troops had trained for a surprise attack at dawn, but at the last minute, plans changed. The uprising was now set for 5 p.m. But it's hard to hide that many people spoiling for a fight. And by 5 p.m., sporadic engagements had already broken out across the city. The Polish troops were barely armed, many without weapons at all. Charging in with homemade submachine guns or captured German rifles, they took the gas works, the power and water plants, and some vital production facilities. But they were repulsed in key locations as well. The bridges, the airport, the rail line, and the main police station all remained in German hands. Most crucially, though, they failed to link up. By night, groups were erecting barricades. The city was now divided, and though there would be some coordination and reinforcement, many pockets were now fighting in their own small wars. And that makes complete sense, right? Because I don't know how easy it would have been to communicate with others. If you're sort of in hiding before you actually step out and fight, how easy would it be to communicate? If there's all these, all these poles ready to uprise, but you're being secret, it must have been an absolute logistical nightmare to be keeping it secret and to be working as a unit to fend off, uh, well, to fend off the Soviets, for example. You know, it, it's, I don't know how they would have done it. And no wonder why you get different pockets of, of, of Polish units doing basically their own thing, because there's, there's almost no way to communicate with the others. So, it makes complete sense that actually you may have, for example, one section of polls winning and then another section where the polls are losing because there's no real unity. Then the bombs begin to fall. Oh, God. The Luftwaffe is laying waste to the city, not differentiating between civilian areas and those controlled by the resistance. The Polish Home Army doesn't have a single anti-aircraft gun. And all eyes look for signs of the Soviet Air Force, but no planes sporting the Red Star of Russia are anywhere to be seen. Four days into the uprising, the true atrocities start. On orders of Heinrich Himmler, German troops begin going house to house, shooting every inhabitant they find. The old, the infirmed, women, children, all were gunned down. Over the course of a week, tens of thousands of civilians are murdered as they huddled in their homes. But the Polish resistance didn't break. The home army ground the Germans to a halt, though its strongest battalions were also its most tragic, the Grey Ranks. They were made up of the Boy Scouts. Older scouts were frontline troops, better organized, better trained, better disciplined than most of the volunteers. The younger members ran courier duty while the Girl Scouts served as combat medics, nurses, and munition haulers. Children, right? Children. That is, that is what they're saying. Children, even the children, had to stand up and fight for what was theirs. 
And that's always awful, right? That's always awful. When you hear stories, for example, you know, you hear the, you hear all the stories in, in Great Britain of, of young children who desperately tried to sign up. Now, obviously there was an age, a, a, a minimum age of, of how, you know, of the age of what kids could sign up for World War Two and World War One, for example. But the youngsters just wanted the adventure, wanted, didn't want to be left out. So they found ways of, of joining. And you hear about the stories of, of the families and the children that don't come back. But ah, oh, it's just it, there's always something worse, isn't there? When you when you hear about children going to war, it's just not nice. It, you know, children should be have an innocent life and and be f- having fun and yeah, not this. And they all swore an oath. I pledge to you that I shall serve the gray ranks, safeguard the secrets of the organization, obey orders, and not hesitate to sacrifice my life. And they would hold this oath all the way unto their death. They fought house to house, door to door, in the chaotic melee of city fighting. Classmates died side by side, first loves torn apart by machine gun fire. They referred to each other as bees because they were a hive, a collective, and they would sting the Germans. They fought with the fury only possessed by the young and the righteous, and they pushed the Nazis from the burnt-out remains of the Warsaw Ghetto. They cut into the German line far enough to liberate one of the concentration camps. 384 Jews who had survived the extermination of the ghetto were still imprisoned there, and they took up arms to fight against oh. those who had enslaved them. I, I did not know about the ghetto situation. That must have been a huge victory for, for the Poles, being able to get these Jews out of the ghetto um, and out of basically, well, saving their life and... I bet these guys were pretty pissed off, right? And they probably wanted revenge. So to have these guys now all of a sudden on, on your side, that was probably a huge moment. Who had murdered everyone they knew. But then, the young fighters of the Grey Ranks were faced with the unthinkable. Something I don't know as a human being you could face. German tanks rolled forward. But it wasn't the hundred tons of steel and death that stopped the scouts. They had faced tanks before, armed only with rifles and hand grenades. No, it was what was in front of the tanks, because in front of those tanks were women. Some burned or beaten, all Polish. The Nazis were using them as human shields. It was this the scouts couldn't face. So the advance turned to a stalemate, and still aid did not come. What? Jesus! This is not a story I've ever heard. This, this is, wow. Oh. Just sick and awful. And it's easy for me to say this now, but you just think, surely these, you know, these Nazis had a conscience and maybe some did, but surely you don't think you're you're the good guy when you're using women and children as a as a shield for your tanks. I, I... wow, that is just rough to hear and really difficult to listen to. Can you imagine? Uh, This is the thing. You can only imagine. And I can say this, right. Can you imagine what it was like for these women and children stuck in front of those tanks that had been beaten, bruised, battered, having to walk in front of these tanks? But then can you imagine uh, the the, the, the um, grey skins and and, and these scouts and things, what needing to stop these tanks, but knowing that are, there are all these Polish women and children in front of them. Just give it a thought. And I don't think I can imagine. I, I don't think I can because it's truly horrific. And, and some of the things, most of the things that these Nazis did. Oh, I am glad I wasn't around then. That's all I can say. By the end of August, the undersupplied Polish forces had to withdraw from Warsaw's Old Town, 
making their way through the sewers to more easily held points. For nearly a month, the soldiers, and many of the civilians, had been living off barley from a brewery the Grey Ranks had captured early in the fighting. Soon even water was scarce, with waterways clogged with corpses and Germans cutting off remaining water mains as they advanced. At last, on the 15th of September, Soviet forces appeared on the far banks of the Vistula. A crossing attempt is made, but Soviet command only sent the lightly armored division of Polish volunteers who had joined them after the fall of Poland to try to relieve Warsaw. Of the 1,600 men who went, more than 1,000 fell to German guns. The Soviets decide that a crossing was impractical, and no further attempt would be made to aid the Polish partisans. Meanwhile, America finally attempts an airdrop of supplies, but 80% of it is accidentally dropped behind German lines. Uh, yeah, no, no SHIT. The Germans had most, literally had control of most of the city, right? So how is an airdrop really going to help? That does, that is sort of typical Yankee thinking though, isn't it? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, most of the, most of the poles are underground. Like, <sighs> American forces will not try again. The resistance is shelled day and night. Great mortars with shells two feet in diameter rain down on them. Rockets slam into the few remaining upright buildings, and tanks hammer away at foxholes for scouts armed with no more than rifles. The Germans advance on the Makatuf district. The resistance is pushed back. They enter one of the major hospitals under Polish control, and they execute every wounded soldier and all of the hospital's personnel. Again, the resistance flees through the sewers, but 150 of them exit too early and are killed by German troops. The Poles now control only a few square blocks right against the river. They were surrounded, starving, outgunned, and outnumbered. And yet, they fought. Not like bees, but like wasps. Every house was a stronghold, every doorway a bunker, and they fought within sight of the Soviet army across the river. Yet no aid came. They fought with the determination of the damned. They fought and fell. The outcome was inevitable. Surrender had to come. Germans wary of fighting and interested in concentrating on the Soviet threat offered terms. The entire population of Warsaw was to be expelled, but no one was to be executed. The terms were accepted. The resistance fighters spent their last days forging documents for the Jewish members among them. 15,000 of the home army were taken away as POWs, and 500,000 civilians were shipped out of the city. The lucky ones were simply let go, with no homes, no food, no jobs. But 60,000 ended up in the death camps, and 90,000 more found themselves unloaded at forced labor yards. And after the surrender, Himmler said, The city must completely disappear from the surface of the earth, and serve only as a transport station for the Wehrmacht. No stone can remain standing. Every building must be raised to its foundation. And to think, and, and um, Warsaw or Warsaw uh, is on my list of places to go, of course, but to think that it was completely wiped out, right? And there is a capital city standing there right now. And, and so it's going to be really interesting when I do go to, to, uh, to Warsaw, uh, what it looks like now, um, knowing that it was completely wiped out. And in one of the last great acts of senseless destruction perpetrated by the Nazi regime, German engineers took flamethrowers and dynamite and systematically, building by building, block by block, wiped Warsaw off the map. By the time three months later, when the Russians finally crossed the Vistula, 85% of the buildings in Warsaw had been leveled. Monuments, schools, libraries, historical sites all reduced to rubble and ash. If you go to the historic district of Warsaw today, what you're actually seeing is a reconstruction, <laughs> an attempt to rebuild based on old photographs and paintings. If you walk the halls of the royal castle, you're not seeing a building that's been standing for 400 years. Instead, you walk through a palace completed in 1984. Wow. And in the rubble of that city lay 70% of the young people of the gray ranks. But their sacrifice was not forgotten. For their nation still stands, long after the thousand-year Reich was wiped from the earth. Ah, oh, it's just truly horrific. It is truly horrific. And these sort of events are the reason why you need to remember them. You know, and I know through generation after generation after generation, it gets harder 
to imagine these things and, and actually feel what they felt. It's just the way it is, you know. But you have to have something that makes people remember to try and to try and ensure it doesn't happen again. The only problem is these things do happen again. You, you know, you said you see it with Ukraine, you see it in other countries and these are tr absolute atrocities keep happening. But I love the way uh, Warsaw does has the siren um, and everyone knows just to stop, think, remember. But some of the atrocities, like the atrocities that, for example, the Nazis did, then followed by the Soviets, is just, I say unimaginable. But you just you just question why. What, like, surely people had the guilt, had the, I, do, I don't know. Surely they re some of them realised that what they were doing was wrong. But I suppose brainwashing happens and... People are made to think that what they're doing is right. But when you are slaughtering people, clearly that's not right. You know, it's not right. You are the bad guys if you're slaughtering people. I know it was a cartoon, but it's really difficult to watch. Well, keep remembering. Let's try and stop these things from happening again. Try is the is the is the word there thank you so much for watching please like subscribe if you want to check out my trips to poland and our other trips to other countries then please go to charlieandrob.com or charlie and rob on youtube and you can see our trips uh we've been to well charlie's been to Gdansk. we've been to krakow uh, i went to wrocław and there are more trips to come and we are we will come to uh, Warsaw, that's the English term. And we will learn a bit more about this crazy history, horrific history in some sense. Thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe, and I'll catch you next time.